Hello and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Today's topic, Managing Pain and Inflammation in Pancreatitis, presented by Kara Burns. Kara Burns is a licensed veterinary technician with a master's degree in physiology and a master's degree in counseling psychology. Ms. Burns is the founder and past president of the Academy of Veterinary Nutrition Technicians and has attained her VTS in nutrition. She teaches nutrition courses around the world on the VIN Veterinary Support Personnel Network. She is the Director of Veterinary Nursing for the North American Veterinary Community, MABC, and the Editor-in-Chief of Today's Veterinary Nurse. She was named the North American Veterinary Conference Technician Speaker in 2013 and in 2016. She was granted an honorary VTS in internal medicine in 2011 and an honorary VTS in dentistry in 2012. We welcome Kara Burns. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, depending on where you are. Um, thank you so much for, for attending this uh, CE seminar. Um, hopefully we'll uh, have a little bit of fun while we're uh, learning and, and talking a little bit more about pancreatitis. So first, let me do a huge shout out to Assisi Animal Health for having me um, speak today and for sponsoring this, uh, um, this webinar. Uh, wonderful group and it's so important for our industry partners and our friends at Assisi Animal Health to um, to be able to sponsor these sessions so we get the um, we get to attend these either at a reduced price or for free so that's always good yay so thank you um, to Assisi Animal Health so let's Let's start out with some review um, because I know that you guys are already familiar with this. Um, we know that in dogs without pancreatitis, the body has mechanisms to prevent active pancreatic enzymes from coming in contact with surrounding tissues. And then when those mechanisms break down, the active enzymes are released into, into the surrounding tissues leading to autodigestion. So we also know that the pancreas is responsible for producing hormones and enzymes to assist in food digestion. When it becomes inflamed, obviously then we have pancreatitis. I don't need to tell you that the itis on the end of that um, is uh, referencing um, inflammation. And you guys are probably much better at ultrasound um, visualization than I am. Thus, I always like it when they have the, uh, um, the arrows and telling us what, what we're actually looking at. Um, I'm sure the, the veterinarians on the call are, uh, are on the webinar are already very familiar with this. But, um, but here you can see um, inflammation um, surrounding that inflamed pancreas. And so with pancreatitis, we also know that it's relatively common, okay? It's, um, it's more common in dogs than in cats, but it might not always be diagnosed. Um, sometimes it's underdiagnosed because as we know, dogs can suffer from mild um, recurrent bouts where the owner will just, you know, the pet owner saying that, well, they had a bad day. They weren't eating very well. They're kind of just laying around. Um, they maybe vomited a bit and were uncomfortable. So they were getting ready to, um, to make that call to your hospital and then the dog seemed better. So what we also know is that it's extremely painful. Even in those um, that, that may present um, asymptomatically or we're not seeing um, you know, a lot of the symptoms that we're gonna talk about. Uh, so so we, we need to be cognizant that this is a, a painful disease. And it also can be life-threatening. So when we're talking about acute pancreatitis, 
typically I would throw it out there and ask you guys, what does acute pancreatitis mean? And you would tell me sudden, <laughs> yeah. And then I would say, you know, typically when do we see these? Um, do we see these cases? And you guys would say, you know, typically after fatty food um, around certain holidays, right? Um, Thanksgiving obviously is a big one. Uh, um, summertime cookouts or barbecues where uh, the dogs are getting into things um, that maybe they haven't gotten into before. Um, and it's typically with extremely fatty foods. So fatty human foods, uh, pork, beef, and then there's our garbage gut dogs as well. So we oftentimes see uh, pancreatitis after um, one of the, the dogs gets into the, the rubbish, right? And, and back in the day, um, I'm probably older than a lot of you on, on the webinar. Um, when I first started in veterinary medicine, the poster child, if you will, for um, pancreatitis um, was pretty much German Shepherd. So, or not for pancreatitis, for garbage gut. So um, garbage gut dogs at that time were, um, were more the German Shepherd dog um, or, or crosses. Today, what I'm hearing, what I'm seeing is, and you know, and I would ask you, what is, what are you seeing? Um, I, I'm hearing that a lot of Labradors <laughs> are, uh, are, have replaced German Shepherds as the, uh, the poster dog, if you will, for getting into the garbage. So, Oh, there we go. So with chronic pancreatitis, don't you love these, these words, right? Acute and chronic. So, so yeah, so with a chronic, it occurs slowly over time. And typically it develops from several acute cases of pancreatitis, right? So that makes sense. There's acute, and then as we get numbers of um, cases, acute cases, then it becomes more of a chronic pancreatitis. So can cats get pancreatitis? Absolutely. And that was a rhetorical question. I know you know that. <laughs> so, but what are some of the risk factors for, for pancreatitis in cats? Well, cats of any age, breed, or gender can develop pancreatitis. We also um, know that older cats appear to be more likely to develop chronic disease um, and that typically then um, can lead into um, other disease conditions um, uh, such as excrement pancreatic insufficiency um, and we also know that uh, domestic short-haired cats and Siamese cats, even though I said earlier, any age, any breed, we are seeing it slightly more in older cats. And as far as breeds are concerned, domestic short hair and Siamese cats. So what are some of the risk factors for dogs? Well, again, Gave you, gave you them on, on the screen, right? We know miniature poodles, schnauzers, um, cocker spaniels, those are um, breeds that are more prone to pancreatitis. And then um, what about age? Older dogs, again, um, seem to be more susceptible to pancreatitis. And there's one more big one, no pun intended, but that should have given you the, uh, um, the clue, obesity. So obesity, we know is a risk factor for so many different things, diabetes, um, osteoarthritis. It's also a risk factor for pancreatitis. So we've already talked about our pet owners that are sharing their high fat meals. Um, with, with their pets. We know that they're going to do that. We know that they do already do that. But here we have um, what looks like fish and chips or maybe chicken tenders and fries. Um, these are high fat foods for us as humans. 
And so then to be sharing this, we're just, you know, the owners are, are just kind of um, creating a, a perfect storm for, um, for a visit to you at the veterinary hospital. And then again, our garbage gut dogs. We, we know um, getting into um, compost or the garbage or things that they haven't been um, introduced to before, but dogs being dogs, especially Labradors, um, love Labradors. I'm sure many of you have them, but we also know that Labradors would probably eat a rock, you know, if they could, um, and some do. So it's not unusual for them to get into the garbage. So what are some of the risk factors um, for pancreat pancreatitis, but when we're thinking of concurrent disease conditions? Well, we mentioned one, right? The, the lower right-hand corner, obesity. It's the most common concurrent disease that put dogs at risk for pancreatitis. It's also one of the most preventable risk factors. And then if we go over to the, um, the left lower, then certain medications um, such as anticholinergics, um, chlorothiazide, furosemide, and tetracyclines have been associated with increased risk for pancreatitis. As we, as we continue um, to the top right-hand side, um, hypercalcemia, is another um, risk factor, uh, oftentimes seen in lymphoma, which this dog um, has. And then in the top left-hand side, um, hyperlipidemia can be secondary to pancreatitis, but it can also be a risk factor for pancreatitis. So what are some of the signs and symptoms you guys know this just as well as I do. So it's a little review for you. Vomiting, diarrhea, severe lethargy, dehydration. And how about, how about that painful position, that downward dog position that our owners will tell us about and that we'll see upon presentation, right? They are in extreme pain. They're trying to get away from that pain or to alleviate that pain. So oftentimes they will be um, in this position that you see this French bulldog in with the hind elevated, right? They're trying to, to alleviate that pain. We also know fever, shock, um, and also um, jaundice. So this is your realm, diagnostics. We as veterinary technicians, I as a vet tech specialist can help um, run these diagnostics. We should be taking the history, right? Um, hopefully you are allowing your, your veterinary technicians, veterinary nurses to take histories, but we should be taking the history and doing a nutritional history. We, we obviously need to find out what has this pet gotten into? Could it have been the garbage, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to do um, a pretty in-depth nutritional history. Also a physical exam, including body condition and palpating, obviously the abdomen, and then diagnostic imaging. So let's first start with nutritional history. What we need to do is ask our pet owner what they're feeding and why. So what is that pet owner giving in a 24 hour period? We don't want um, our veterinary nurses to, to say, hey, are you feeding treats? Did you give bacon? That's gonna put them on the defensive. Let's take a step back and have your veterinary nurses ask questions more along the lines of, what does Fluffy get in a 24 hour period? Um, have your pet owners tell the nurses everything that passes their pet's lips, whether it's solid or liquid. We're gonna get a lot of important information that's gonna help you in your diagnosis and, um, and to help us 
manage this case and manage the pain um, that goes along with pancreatitis. So, you know, I, I'd love to ask if you don't mind answering, I guess, in the Q&A or the um, chat feature, um, how many of you are doing or having your teens do um, a, a nutritional history, maybe an, even an in-depth nutritional history? Is anyone out there doing those? All right, always every time. Thank you for playing. <laughs> so someone is uh, um, is willing to uh, to interact. So thank you. And I know um, the rest of you are probably like, "Hey, you're just supposed to be talking to me. Uh, I'm not supposed to be answering questions. It's my uh, lunch hour or whatever." So I appreciate it, and thank you for um, allowing me to uh, uh, to indulge and, and ask some questions. But yeah, so thank you. Um, Dr. O'Leary for answering that and saying, yeah, every time. It's so important to not only every patient that comes in, but specifically to our pancreatitis patients. So um, if you don't have a nutritional history that, um, that your team uh, utilizes, um, WASAVA, so World Small Animal Veterinary Association, uh, which is wasava.org, has um, some that you can download. This is one that I use. I'm happy to, um, to share that. Um, but it's, it's really just going to give us an I uh, give us kind of a checklist or a, a reminder to, to ask certain questions. But really what we're trying to get in, get from the patient is what that pet eats normally or could have and could have gotten into. Okay. So next up, what else for diagnostics? Well, I think we know radiographs, right? You guys are probably doing radiographs, um, trying to rule out foreign bodies, um, looking for displacement of organs. And then as we've seen in some of the ultrasound um, images that I've, I've had, um, you're probably also doing uh, an ultrasound to confirm that pancreatic inflammation. And again, this is amazing. I love how many hospitals have ultrasounds. Um, again, when I started a, a, a few years ago, um, ultrasounds were, were pretty much in maybe big specialty hospitals or, um, or teaching hospitals. But, um, but I am thrilled to see so many uh, ultrasounds across the, across the country in, um, in practices. And not only are you guys as veterinarians um, familiar with those and using those, but you're um, empowering your technicians to do so as well. So, um, so again, that was an aside, just a little shout out to all of you. So here again, um, we see the, uh, the uh, ultrasound um, of a dog with pancreatitis. We see that the pancreas is enlarged and appears heterogeneous. Um, with, and with hyperechoic areas, which are the white arrows, which I probably don't have to tell you, <laughs> um, and hyperechoic sounding, uh, surrounding the fat, which is the black arrows here. And so this would be suggestive to you, I'm assuming, um, of pancreatitis. So let's talk about management, since that's going to be the, the big thing um, that we're here to talk about today. How are we going to manage this pain and this inflammation? Well, obviously, if I'm talking to you, then we're going to focus on nutrition. Along with nutrition comes fluid and electrolyte therapy. And then more in your realm, um, anti-nausea and anti-vomiting medications. And then pain management. So pain management um, in, in a couple of different ways, and we're going to talk about those. Okay, so let me ask you guys a question. Metabolically, are these two patients the same? And um, I was just seeing if anyone would answer. <laughs> um, 
I'm sure that you said no. Um, the, the dog on the left is a um, dog with severe inflammatory, uh, inflammatory bowel disease and approaching losing enteropathy. The dog on the right is a dog that um, has had some food, but not enough. Um, so it's basically been neglected and has had chronic food deprivation. So the difference being the dog on the left is suffering from stress starvation and the dog on the right is suffering from simple starvation. So with simple starvation, lack of food intake is going to cause a normal metabolic shift to a hypo metabolic state because the body is conserving structural and functional proteins as much as possible. So glucose and fatty acids being the primary energy source, sparing that lean muscle. In stress starvation, the inflammatory response triggers alterations in cytokines and hormone concentrations and shifts that metabolism toward a catabolic state at the onset of injury or the onset of pancreatitis. So with a lack of food intake, the predominant energy source comes from um, accelerated breakdown of endogenous protein um, or proteolysis. So what is happening there is the body is consuming its own lean muscle and it is in a catabolic state. So why is this important? Because with inadequate nutrient intake, it's hard for the body to then try to heal or combat pancreatitis, um, major traumas, um, sepsis, etc. So, so with this, if we're not seeing adequate nutrition in these patients, then we have impaired immune function, um, impaired tissue synthesis and repair, any medications that you are um, prescribing for your pancreatitis patient um, might not be able to, um, to focus on what you are prescribing it for. There's altered metabolism of the medications. So let's look at some nutritional management. We know that GI conditions respond to dietary intervention. We also know that early nutritional intervention is critical. And we're going to talk a little bit about that because I know in the past um, it's been, oh, no, we don't want to, you know, feed them right off. We want to rest the pancreas. Well, we're, we're going to talk about that. And we're also going to, to focus on just a few of the key nutrients um, before getting into um, some of the, uh, the pain and inflammation um, uh, modalities. So traditionally, I think you guys have known um, that the approach was to rest the pancreas. Um, the nutritional recommendation for, for management um, has been strict pancreatic rest because it was believed that fasting would prevent feedback that would then further stimulate exocrine pancreatic secretion. This would then protect against autodigestion to, to some extent. But that theory was from human medicine, looking at healthy humans. It was never really tested in dogs and cats. So it's come into question, and it's actually been demonstrated um, that, um, that exocrine pancreatic secretion is in fact decreased during pancreatitis. And the decrease is most prominent in patients with severe inflammation. So rather than being beneficial, fasting being beneficial, um, it actually could lead to intestinal muco mucosal sorry, atrophy, and pterocyte apoptosis, and a breakdown in the intestinal barrier, resulting in increased intestinal permeability. 
So the consequences of those alterations um, is that the gut itself starts to contribute to the systemic inflammatory response in acute pancreatitis. Obviously, there's enough going on. We do not want that. So are we going to keep them NPO? Hopefully, your response was no. <laughs> in fact, what we're going to do is start nutrition early by giving an antiemetic on a mission, starting nutrition early, either via the, um, the normal eating process or through a tube, we can get these patients feeling better and shorten their hospitalization. So some of the advantages of enteral feeding Decreased bacterial translocation, increased immune response, and, and a decrease in the cytokine generated stress responses. So we want to get these guys, we want to get nutrients into them as soon as we can. So here we have um, uh, a study looking at acute pancreatitis, looking at parenteral nutrition or enteral nutrition. And it's just a small study. Um, 10 dogs, five were put on parenteral, five were put on enteral. And what was found was that four out of the five um, that were uh, given parenteral nutrition survived. All of those in the enteral, cat on enteral group survived. But I think one of the most important findings was that there was no increase of pain with feeding in the enteral group. Because I know historically that has been, a, you know, we don't want to feed them, they're already in pain, this is going to exacerbate that pain, when in fact it does not. Vomiting, only one of the five in the enteral nutrition group um, experienced any vomiting. And as you would expect, um, there were more catheter complications with the parenteral nutrition group. So let's, let's start thinking of nutrition in our pancreatitis patients right away, especially, and you guys know this better than I do, um, especially with the antiemetics that we have today. Because again, early enteral nutrition is going to help stimulate um, regeneration of the intestinal mucosa. And we already talked about um, uh, the uh, degeneration um, of the intestinal mucosa in pancreatitis. It's gonna decrease cytokine production and modulate acute phase responses. Decreased cat um, catabolism, we know they're in a stress starvation um, metabolic state. So getting nutrients into them early can help decrease that catabolism and preserve protein. So again, this is a slide for, um, for you. It, we know that the newer antiemetics out there are able to, to make this possible. I, I would ask how many of you are using Serenia and I bet most of you would, would um, raise your uh, virtual hand. Um, but, we know that Serenia is a neurokinin-1 antagonist label for dogs. I'm sure many of you are using it off-label in cats. The experience has been very, very um, good in, in dogs. So um, that's all I'm going to say about that because this is your, your realm more so than mine. So, um, so let's talk about just to, to drive home this point one more time, the relationship of energy balance to clinical outcome. And so we know that there are significant metabolic derangements associated with stress starvation. How are we going to tell if it affects outcomes? Well, this is one study that, that shows this. Um, this was done by um, uh, Rebecca Remillard, who is a board, boarded nutritionist. And basically, of these 276 dogs, said almost three quarters of them had a negative energy balance. 
And you can see the reasons, which are painful. 22% um, had illegible orders. Now, I know doctors, you, you know, you guys um, are in a hurry and, and, you know, the stereotype is that you have funny, you know, or illegible writing. But this is on both, um, both the vets and the nurses. If, I, if my veterinarian, if I can't read his or her order, I'm going to go and ask them. I'm not just going to, I don't know what happened here, made up their own, um, I'm not sure. Uh, so, so it comes down to communication, and, and I know that you all know that. 34% um, were held without food, and we've already talked about that, so we know that we're not going to do that. 44% refused food. Now, by refused food, they were offered a, um, you know, a dish with some food in it they didn't want to eat, where the, the team actually should have put a tube in to get nutrition into them and get nutrients into them. So, um, so those are, you know, reasons that we can overcome. Um, because on the flip side of that, you'll see on the right hand side, 27% with a positive energy balance had much better outcomes. They, um, they were, they, they got better sooner. They didn't have as long hospitalization because we were able to get new, we, I had nothing to do with this study because they were able to, um, to get nutrients into the patients. So we can flip that left side to the right side in more and more of our patients just by communication, not resting the gut or the pancreas. And if they don't want to eat, we can put a tube in. We know that enteral nutrition is well tolerated. Um, it can be easily digested, but we have to use a highly digestible um, um, formulation. It's easily absorbed, has essential nutrients, and oftentimes with our um, critical and or recovery patients, we have a high energy formulation. So they eat um, less of it because it's so energy dense. And I do want to just briefly mention um, semi-elemental nutrition because there is semi-elemental nutrition out there. Um, the pancreatitis patient, as we know, has no extra energy to spare. So that energy is better served in the pancreatitis patient in the healing and repair of the body. And with elemental or semi-elemental nutrition, what we're giving the patient is highly digestible nutrients in small sizes. So it's quick and easy assimilation of nutrients. So let's look at, at just a couple of um, uh, nutrients of concern in our um, pancreatitis patients. So water, well, yep, we know, we know that, right? Obviously, they're losing a ton of water through, um, through vomiting and diarrhea. You guys, you know, you know that um, as well as I do. But, but are we thinking of it becoming a life-threatening dehydration? Because it easily could. Because these patients are unable to replace the, the fluid that has been lost. So, um, we should be supporting them with either sub-Q or IV um, fluids rather than oral fluids, unless we get the anti-emetics on board and probably in addition to, um, and because of we need to replace and stabilize the, uh, the dehydration. So what about electrolytes? So we know that gastric and intestinal secretions differ from extracellular fluids and electrolyte composition. So their loss can result in systemic electrolyte abnormalities. Dogs and cats presenting with, with pancreatitis and specifically with vomiting and diarrhea may have abnormal serum potassium, chloride, and sodium. So serum electrolyte concentrations are useful when we're trying to tailor the appropriate fluid therapy and nutritional management. So
So we know protein in our pancreatitis patients, um, protein actually is a stimulus for pancreatic um, secretion. So we shouldn't have excess protein, but we need enough protein for the life stage and to enable the patient um, enough protein slash amino acids to recover and repair tissues. And so glutamine is one of the um, essential, uh, one of the amino acids that is essential for, um, for recovering pancreatitis um, patients. It's the most abundant amino acid in the plasma and the pancreas has high protein turnover so glutamine supplementation in animals has prevented atrophy of pancreatic ancinar cells, improved pancrea um, pancreatic exocrine function, and has improved outcomes following critical illness. Now, additionally, arginine. Arginine is an essential amino acid in both cats and dogs. Um, although in cats, they can develop clinical signs of deficiency uh, more rapidly than dogs. Arginine has um, immunomodulatory functions affecting lymphocyte proliferation and um, macrophage activation. Arginine levels are reduced in both humans and canines with critical illness such as pancreatitis and subnormal concentrations have um, been negatively related to survival. So when we're talking protein, we have to, to really think about um, getting down to another level. So yes, protein as a whole, but also what amino acids um, do we need to be concerned about? Glutamine and arginine um, being two critical ones. So with fat, we know that higher fat foods empty more slowly from the stomach. Think of the last time you had a, a high fat um, uh, meal or, you know, in that picture from earlier with the, uh, the fish and chips or the chicken tenders and French fries. Think about eating that and then how you feel, you know, an hour or two later. That food is still sitting there, right? Because it's high fat food. And so fat actually delays gastric emptying. And how low do we want to go? Well, we want to have our patients or our dogs on um, a lower fat formula that should be lower than the amount fed prior. So for instance, if you have um, uh, a, a dog that had been eating um, a food that had, you know, 20% fat, then we want to lower, we want to um, recommend a lower than 20% for their recovery. So, okay, now I'm talking about fat as a nutrient, not, um, not this pug. <laughs> this pug obviously has, the, has that risk factor of obesity. Um, and for your patients that are obese or maybe have high triglycerides, then we want an even lower fat. And truly the numbers will pay, play a role here. So 10% or less on a dry matter basis in dogs and 15% or less on a dry matter basis in cats. And what this is doing is helping to reduce the triglycerides. Now, having just said that, um, there are some recent findings, um, especially by Dr. Dan Chan, who is a uh, boarded criticalist as well as a boarded nutritionist. And he has found that um, cats can digest, well, I, I think more nutritionists have found um, that cats can digest and use high levels of dietary fat. But what Dr. Chan is saying is that the current evidence is not supporting restricting fat in cats with pancreatitis. So um, I would say more to come on that. Um, historically, we have been um, um, restricting fat levels in cats. And, and as I just said, 15% or less. Um, 
And so I, I guess the best thing here is uh, stay tuned. Um, and if you want to go by what we have been um, recommending historically, let's do 15% or less. Okay. So with um, cobalamin, we know that um, pancreatitis in cats can be complicated by um, inflammatory bowel disease um, and even triaditis. So uh, first with cobalamin, um, parenteral supplementation is recommended. And again, I usually just go by the literature to, um, to give um, recommended doses. This is not um, something that I recommend. Um, I, I can't, this is not in my bailiwick. That's why I, um, that's why I take from the literature to, uh, to educate. But again, whether you're a veterinary nurse or a veterinarian, it is up to the veterinarian. Um, so if you are a veterinary nurse that is listening in, it's up to your veterinarian to, um, to make the recommendation and prescribe the, the amount. I can tell you, um, my own cat um, did have uh, cobalamin um, supplementation and it was a game changer. Um, definitely a, a lifesaver for, for, for my cat. Um, okay, so next, omega-3 fatty acids. Talk about you know, trying to um, help with inflammation. Well, omega-3 fatty acids, I think as we all know, helps to break the cycle of inflammation. It helps to stabilize um, cell membranes, especially inflammation associated with pancreatitis. So we want to look for, um, um, if we're prescribing a specific um, nutritional formula, we want to make sure it has omega-3 fatty acids in it. So this is just um, a very brief summary slide. If you wanted to, um, to look at percentages of um, fat and protein, um, and again, we're focusing on the fat in both non-obese um, and non-high triglyceride dogs as well as, um, and cats, as well as those that are obese and have um, high triglycerides. The important takeaway is that the fat must be lower than the food fed prior to the episode. All right, so anti-emetics. Um, again, this is going to be you as the veterinarian, um, your, your bailiwick more so than mine. But as I said earlier, with the newer anti-emetics, we can get them on board soon then it gives us a great timetable to then start feeding our patients and getting nutrients into them much sooner. Um, Anti-emetic therapy is extremely important. Uh, metoclopramide antagonizes dopamine at the receptor site, which could have a negative impact on pancreatic perfusion and therefore is not the drug of first choice. Um, Dolacetron and odansetron are five HT3 um, serotonergic receptor antagonists that have much stronger anti-emetic properties than metoclopramide. Um, we know that um, uh, dolacetron and odansetron both can be safely used in the dog, um, and you probably know the doses uh, better than I do, so I will leave that to you. My point here being, if we're trying to manage pain and inflammation, and we know that um, nutrition is one way to, to do that, let's get antiemetics on board as soon as possible. Now, um, with analgesia and it's National Pain Awareness Month, um, so, um, so 
happy National Pain Awareness Month to you. Um, we know that dogs with pancreatitis have both local and visceral pain. So pain being the fourth vital assessment, um, your nurses, your veterinary technicians should be doing a pain assessment. And there are a number of different pain assessments out there for both dogs and cats. Um, I think most people are, um, or most in our profession are um, accustomed to the canine and feline acute pain scale um, out of Colorado State. But let's make sure that our teams are doing um, a pain evaluation. Um, it's, you know, it's one thing to, to be able to see if the dog is in that downward dog position um, and we're palpating and, and it's obviously painful, but cats and, you know, some dogs aren't going to show that. So we need to, uh, to be doing our um, pain scores. And you will obviously also be prescribing um, analgesia in the form of different um, medications. I put this up here um, just as a reference. Uh, there's a number of great references out there. This is just one. Um, and again, this is um, this one is from today's veterinary practice, but I've seen them in clinicians' brief, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I can't talk to this other than to remind um, my colleagues to ask the veterinarians about um, analgesia and to, uh, to talk to the owners about it. So, which brings us to, okay, we've talked about pain medications and we don't want this downward dog um, appearance anymore. Um, we've talked about analgesia and there's, you know, intermittent dosing, continuous rate infusion, whatever you feel is, um, is best for your patients. But one other thing that I wanted to talk to you about was the Assisi loop. And I'm sure many of you have, um, had experience with the, um, Assisi loop, but this again is, um, help with, uh, it's a modality to help with pain and inflammation specifically for your pancreatitis patients. And, and so what we're seeing is targeted pulsed electromagnetic field um, therapy. And it delivers a signal that's tuned specifically to minimize pain and to accelerate healing. And you can see here how this is applied on both dogs and cats. And if you haven't um, become familiar with the Assisi loop, there are a, a lot of different disease conditions um, that the Assisi loop can help with, but pancreatitis is a, is a big one. Um, and so, as I said, it delivers a signal that is tuned specifically to help minimize pain, accelerate healing. And for those animals, those pancreatitis patients that are painful and, as we know, um, have inflammation, um, we're, this signal, as you can see on the third uh, bullet point here, stimulates the body's own natural anti-inflammatory process while speeding the healing of tissues. What it's doing is it's upregulating the production of endogenous nitric oxide. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, I, I've used them. Um, I've seen other veterinary practices use them because what are some of the benefits? They're just what we've been talking about. Reducing pain, increasing mobility, improving circulation. It's, it's accelerating healing. So imagine this as with a multimodal approach. So we have the assisi loop, nutritional management, and your um, pain management. So this, the, um, this multimodal approach is going to get these patients feeling better much sooner. It's gonna help obviously reduce swelling um, and it is compatible with other treatments for, for pain and inflammation. So um, obviously in this instance, um, if you are prescribing pain medications along with nutritional management of pancreatitis, 
this is another modality that will help your patients to feel better sooner. Um, no dangerous side effects, that's always important. <laughs> um, and really the mechanism of action for the assisi loop is, as I said before, to upregulate the production of endogenous nitric oxide, which is the body's own anti-inflammatory molecule. It helps speed the healing of, of tissue. So I know we're getting close to the end, so I will um, wrap up, but we know that pancreatitis is extremely painful. We've seen it for how, how long now in our patients. And we talked about the difference between stressed and simple starvation and how getting nutrients into the patient is going to help stabilize them and help get them on the road to recovery sooner. We talked about early feeding equaling early recovery because if we can get nutrients into these guys and it's much easier now with the newer antiemetics that, that you are prescribing, then we can get them again on the road to earlier recovery. No more resting the pancreas, okay? Let's get nutrients into these guys as soon as possible. Pancreatitis is a multimodal approach. I'm always gonna focus on the nutrition part, but there's, if it's multimodal, then we also have um, the, the analgesics that you as veterinarians can, um, uh, can prescribe. And then hopefully you are already using the Assisi Loop. And if not, you have to try this because to have this multimodal approach to help with our pancreatitis patients, which, you know, historically we haven't had a lot of, of um, help. So, um, so nutrition, pain relief, inflammation, um, anti-inflammatories in, in terms of um, nutrients and the assisi loop because it helps with pain and inflammation. So it's, it's an awesome multimodal approach that we now have available to us.